Thank you all for viewing this talk. I'd like to also thank the committee for this great honor. This is joint work with Lior Covalio, Noam Nissan, and Asaf Rom. So before I tell you about the matching that we did for the gap year programs, let me first tell you how it is to grow up in Israel. So after high school, we don't go to college. We go to three years of mandatory military service. Then usually we go to one year of a big trip abroad to forget about our military service. And then we actually only go to university. And if this age isn't late enough to start university, in recent years, it has become very popular to take another gap year of volunteering before the start of the military service. And a very popular way to do so in Israel is to go to a pre-military academy, PMA. This is pre-military only in the chronological sense. Actually, you don't study how to be a better soldier or anything. You study quote unquote, non-useful stuff. You don't get a certificate. Most of what you do is volunteer in far locations or quote unquote, bad neighborhoods, lived in cramped apartments, and you actually pay for this. You may ask why. Think uh, the local analog, I believe, would be Teach for America. Uh, both candidates and parents would tell you that this is to get to know the world around you, to think about the society around you, to make friends and influence people and to, uh, quote unquote, grow up. So uh, there are three kinds of PMAs, secular, religious, and mixed secular religious. We're going to talk about the secular and mixed called together the general PMAs. There's a very wide variety, even in those varying in geographic location, social political orientation, activity mix, and whatnot. And until 2017, they recruited candidates in the following way. So each PMA would be allocated a number of deferred military service slots. And starting October of each year, the PMAs would advertise to high school seniors, even send representatives to some high schools. And between October and February comes the interview phase. The candidates would visit the PMAs for a weekend. This is kind of a weekend interview, a soft skills interview, somewhat similar to that of US elite colleges. And they would visit in a distributed fashion and it would be accept as you go. And there were many problems with this process, very high over demand, but nonetheless wild competition between the PMAs for the candidates they considered stars or tomorrow's leaders. They gave many exploding offers. It's Saturday now, you have until Monday to let us know if you're in or out of our group for next year. The PMAs did not do that because they were evil. They did that because they needed to build a group in an online fashion and candidates needed to accept or reject with incomplete information because of this. This caused inefficiency, multiple candidate rejections, much uncertainty and doubt. And one of the effects of this was that many match candidates were from the elite and many others were intimidated to even participate because of all of this. Our involvement started in 2017, early 2017. Noam, uh, my co-author and uh, then advisor, his daughter got an exploding offer from a PMA. In March of that year, we searched. Luckily, we found a website of something called the Joint Council of PMAs. We had no idea what that was, but we decided to send a cold call email to their CEO. Dear Danny, I'm a father and a professor. This is Noam. I was not even a doctor yet, so more chances of having the email uh, answered. Here's the link to a popular news article about stable matching. Let us do a centralized matching for you. And I'm really not hiding a lot. The CEO of the Joint Council is called Danny. And in Israel, when you email someone you don't know, you say, Dear Danny, not their surname. So this really is a fairly accurate quote of what happened there. Fast forward seven months later, in October, our online server already opens for candidate registration. Three months later in January, we announced the results of our first matching and we have run that since every year. So now that we have fast forward through this, let's take things in slightly more detail. So the mechanism that we used, again, uh, starting from the end, a variant of Gail Shapley's deferred acceptance, why many of you know this mechanism very well, it's tried and true, hospitals, school choice, whatnot. It was very important here also for the PMAs to retain their independence, to rank separately, and to keep pedagogical control in their own hands, so this was very appropriate. Also, we very much wanted explainable results. PMAs came to us really after the process asking, why did we not get this guy that we ranked first or this guy that we ranked second? And also very important to us, we're strategic guarantees, we'll get to that soon. And going with another approach such as integer programming, very uh, a beautiful paper by Augustone et al, would not have given these properties. Uh, so what's left once we decided on uh, deferred acceptance, basically the details, which is everything. Understand the requirements, define the problem, which variant, how good is it, et cetera. 
So one slide crash course on the part acceptance. Each candidate ranks the PMAs that she is interested in. Each PMA describes its preferences over candidates. I'm intentionally vague here for the moment. And then you repeat in rounds and each round, each candidate proposes to her most preferred PMA that has not previously rejected her. Each PMA then keeps its preferred subset of the candidates that have proposed to it, either newly proposed in this round or in the previous rounds and not rejected, and rejects all the others. And notably, and it's not always described this way, but it many times is, and we're going to use this uh, notation, a PMA's preferences and quotas are expressed via its choice function, the mapping from the proposers to the candidates that it actually keeps. And the matching is stable if it yields no blocking pair, if there's no candidate in PMA such that the candidate prefers this PMA to whatever uh, the candidate got, and the PMA chooses also this candidate given choice from all of uh, the candidates assigned to it plus this candidate. So the easy part was how to handle the ranking of PMAs by the candidates. We have this nice web interface. You can drag and drop PMAs, alter their order. When you're done, you submit. Uh, the preferences of the PMAs is more tricky. They had preferences over individuals, but also each PMA crucially viewed being a meeting place for Israeli society as a very important, not secondary, but primary part of its mission. So they had many group preferences, diversity, they wanted gender balance, they wanted geographical balance for urban people to meet rural people, for religious to meet secular candidates, etc. Not too many people from the same school or town to avoid pre-existing clear. Uh, they also very much cared about affirmative action, reserving spots for candidates from the socioeconomic periphery, for minority groups, for special needs students, for locals if a PMA is in a quote-unquote bad neighborhood, but someone from that neighborhood who wants to join, they don't want to be the snobs from outside who don't let them in. And when we understood this richness of constraints, that's the moment where this service project that we didn't imagine writing a paper about when we started actually surfaces very interesting design questions that would not answered before. So one slide on quotas and deferred acceptance. I urge you to take a look at this uh, survey by Nguyen and Vora. There are two kinds of quotas and deferred acceptance. They are uh, word quota is used for both of them. Inter-institution quotas, the uh, quotas on institutions or on sets of institutions, no more than so-and-so doctors in this area of the country and all the hospitals combined. The quotas that we're interested in are actually intra-institution quotas, quotas on the number of males or females or religious within a certain institution. There's literature on hard minimum quotas. In this literature, the main question would be, does a feasible matching exist? Does a stable matching exist? In our case, the more appropriate thing would be soft quotas, since we can say a stable matching does not exist. Thank you. We have to output some matching every year. So there's a literature here with disjoint populations, Kojima 2012, soft main quotas via max quotas on the majority population. This paper only has a majority and minority population. This is a bit wasteful because not always all seats would be filled. Half a year at all give priority until a minority reserve is filled. This is more efficient. And then there are papers, Ehlers et al, Chinique and Yenmez, that generalize to more than two populations, but all these are for disjoint populations. And the PMA's requirements involved many, many intersecting populations. You could be from a rural area and religious or secular. You could have been from a major city and religious or secular. You get the point. And our approach is to generalize the above also for intersecting populations, taking a modifying priorities approach in the language of Nguyen and Vora, meaning that everything is encoded in the choice function. We'll get to that soon. So we had to devise a language for the PMAs to express their preferences to us. As always, when you describe a preference language or a bidding language, you have to strike a balance between expressiveness strategic stability and various kinds of simplicity. So if I may be so bold, I'd like to tell you how we scored, I think, on each of these. We scored quite well on algorithmic simplicity, reasonably well on expressiveness, we'll get to that. Quite well as well on lack of strategic opportunities, we'll get to that soon. In terms of cognitive simplicity, this actually turned out to be harder than we thought for the PMAs to fill out to express their preferences for us, and we had to walk some of them hand in hand in this but all's well that ends well. So what was this preference solicitation language? It was actually an Excel spreadsheet. They started by listing all of their candidates along with their ID numbers. These are unique identifiers used in Israel and gave uh, us the priority, their 
master ranking of the candidates. And then they could define the populations, male, female, same school, same region, musician, etc. And they could tell us we want 25 at most male, 25 at most female, between two and 10 from the same region, at least three musicians. And as you can see, these are subjective populations. We didn't even want to declare for them who is male and who is female, let alone Asaf Noam and I could not decide on agreed upon definition of musician. Uh, whoever knows us would not be surprised by that. So in the same spreadsheet of defining the candidates, they could also say this candidate is male from school 12, region three, this candidate is female, this candidate is male, et cetera. So they defined completely the populations by themselves. So there's more than one way to transform such a spreadsheet into a choice function. Here's how we chose to do it. Uh, I'd like to remind you that we model quotas as part of the choice function. So given a set of proposers, here's an algorithmic description of the choice function of the way that we choose a subset of the candidates to keep for now. So we traverse over all the proposing candidates in the master order of the PMA's priority, and we greedily pick candidates only if they help us with a quota of under men target populations, but only if they do not exceed any firm maximum quota. So here's the first candidate. Does she help us with any underman uh, target population? No, she does not, so let's not take her. Here's the second. Does she help us? Yes, she does. Let's take her. Here's the third. Does he help us? He does not. Let's not take him, etc. And then when we're done with this first priority pass, for underman target populations, we again traverse all of them in the declared order, and we pick any candidate that does not exceed a maximum quota. So as you can see, any population's max capacity is a firm commitment, it never gets exceeded, and a min target is a best effort kind of thing, a promotion kind of thing. And when we're gonna talk about stability later on, we're gonna talk about stability with respect to this choice function. It's a very good question of how good does this description interpret the PMA's actual preferences expressed through a low dimensional representation of the Excel spreadsheet, we'll get to that as well. One last thing is, as I said, there's more than one way to interpret an Excel spreadsheet as a choice function. A different thing that you could have imagined is have more priority passes. Start with the pass that only picks a candidate if she helps us with five underman target categories, and then do another pass for four underman target categories, etc. We specifically chose not to do this because we spoke with the PMAs and it became clear to us that they would not like one candidate to use very many promotion slots. So we thought what I showed you in the last slide would better describe their actual preferences. So some theory, Huang 2010 tells us that if there are only max quotas and the population structure is laminar, then a stable matching exists. Laminar means here that any two populations are either disjoint or having one contained in the other. We extend this theorem showing that even in the presence of min targets, if for each PMA populations are laminar and min target populations are pairwise disjoint, then everything is okay in even a stronger sense that the choice function satisfies substitutability and relevance of rejected contracts and the law of aggregate demand. These together tell us that the output is stable, that the deferred acceptance algorithm is strategy proof for the candidates and some other desirable properties such as the lattice structure for the stable matchings. Restricted only to max quotas, by the way, our proof is actually a new concise proof of Wang's results showing also strategy proofness in his case. So this should be compared with hard minimums where laminarity is known to imply a polynomial time algorithm for checking even if a stable matching exists and should also be compared with a very recent work by Sunemez and Yenmez who also identify laminarity as important and they call laminarity nested. So on the negative side, Huang tells us that if populations are overlapping, if there are only max quotas, stable matching may not exist and it's NP-hard to determine whether it exists or not. This NP-hardness obviously also transfers to our case if there are overlapping populations. We also show that even populations are laminar, but our second condition of min target populations and not intersecting is violated, then stable matching may not exist. And also in such bad cases, we show that reasonable deferred acceptance variants are not strategy proof for the candidates. Nonetheless, we do manage to show some instead of guarantees, as I promised you. And specifically, we show what we call practical strategy proofness. So for the two easiest to think of manipulation types, we show that they would not help you. And by easiest to think of, I mean, we spoke with candidates. This is the only things that they thought about doing. 
So first one, truncation. A candidate can never gain by truncating her preference list. We spoke to some candidates who said, well, there are six PMAs that we actually rank, but maybe I'm thinking about not listing the sixth one so that maybe I don't get it, but I get the fifth one instead. This will never happen. Second thing is what we call sure thing. If a candidate is assured, and we'll get to that in a moment, of getting some PMA if she ranks it first, then she will also get this PMA or a better one if she reports truthfully. And this should be, in some moral sense, be compared with what P. Troyan and the Thayer Moral call obvious manipulations in a recent paper of theirs. And I talked about assured, so there seemed to have been some pressure on some candidates by PMAs or maybe misunderstanding by candidates who thought that PMAs told them, we rank you in a way that only if you rank us first, you'll get us, otherwise you won't. And this uh, seemed to be a real concern, which causes to mid-season explain this to the candidates in the only way that you can explain things mid-season to this generation by releasing a video and hoping that it go viral. And it actually did. So in a nutshell, here's the video, logo, CEO of the PMAs, a friendly face that they already knew from the recruiting, explaining again how to use the website. Here is me explaining to them that they cannot be harmed by extending their preference list and also that it's never in their interest to swap by moving an assured PMA up and telling them again that we will never, never, not even in retrospect, pass to any PMA their ranking. And then this is reiterated, you shall always rank truthfully by the person that they already knew, and they cannot be demanded some kind of quid pro quo, rank us high so that you'll get us, otherwise you won't, and that they are relieved of any promise that they ever gave any PMA. And this is just one example of how to, to deal with actual people. And we think this actually was quite successful because in a post everything survey, 92%, which is quite high reported beating not strategically. So actual problem and results, quite expectedly heavy use of intersecting populations by almost all PMAs, gender, geography, school, whatnot. Also probably some unexpected categories that were obfuscated from us. To this day, we don't know what orange meant to a specific PMA. Here are some numbers for the past three years in which this was already run. We have 40 PMAs, about 2,000 slots, about 6,000 candidates. Out of the slots, we match around 90%. Out of the candidates that were matched, around 85% were to their top choice. We had virtually no blocking pairs between five and nine, each of them each year involving a single unique PMA, all for the same reason each year. Compare this to Boston, which would have matched less candidates and have many, many more blocking pairs. 50% of the remaining quota was easily filled post-match. We helped them with reserve lists, with block candidates list. There was no stealing allowed by mutual consent and the system was adopted for the foreseeable future. So some lessons learned for the benefit of others you who'd like to go down a similar route. Adoption, it's hard to convince people to adopt a new mechanism. We were fortunate to find one central person, the CEO of the Joint Council, even though he did not have any formal authority. Many of them very much respected his opinion, tailored the selling points to the audience. In our case, a major selling point was reduce the number of no's that a single candidate gets instead of a no every week, either a yes at the end or if there's no choice, one no at the end. What was meant to be a community project actually surfaced interesting design and theoretical questions that may have not been surfaced otherwise, semantics of preferences over populations, practical strategy proofness, Instead of going the route of, in nice instances, a stable matching exists, otherwise it does not, we went the more practical route of, in nice instances, we output a stable matching, otherwise we heuristically output something reasonable. And finally, dealing with real people. For the theorists out there, theory is only the tip of the iceberg. As I said, other aspects are no less important. We had to sit down with PMAs and tell them your spreadsheet looks like you meant something else. Otherwise, their spreadsheet would not have reflected their preferences and the match would have been a flop. Uh, we released this mid-season video saying we released you, of course, promises be truthful. It's easiest always for people and institutions to blame the system through no fault of the system, even for small stuff, and expect heart tearing emails post-match through no fault of your own and keep logs to be able to sleep at night after receiving these emails. Thank you so much. Does anyone know what this is? This is a stable marriage. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you again to the committee for this great honor.